All right, welcome Zach to the podcast. I'm so excited to interview you. I've been waiting for this for a while. Um, do you want to give our listeners just a brief introduction to... Sure. Yeah, so I recently got into longer ultra running. I'm 24 years old, um, originally from Iowa, but I moved out to Utah and I was able to win and set a course record in my first 100 mile, which was the Bear 100, and then <laughs> recently um, also won the Trail 100 Andorra. Mm. Um, and I've done a few other things, but as of now, I'm trying to get into bigger races from there. So did you grow up running, or is this something that you recently got into? So I would do like a little, like a six-week cross-country stint every year in high school and I wasn't great I was like I'd run like a 17 minute 5k and I wasn't even on the varsity team and so I had an I had an idea of what running was but it wasn't until I was on my mission that I kind of started running a little bit more and that Mm -hmm. was back in 2020 and then I've been kind of pretty consistent since then cool yeah for maybe our listeners who don't know what a mission is an LDS mission? Yes, yeah. So just two years, I was in Arizona. It was 100 degrees. So Um, were you running? Yeah. Just stoplight to stoplight on the streets there. They were all half a mile apart, so Mm. it gave me an idea of how far I was going and just got started there. That's crazy. That's cool. So coming back, when did you start getting into trail running? Um, So, yeah, I... Um, ran my first marathon in 2021 and that I'd been running for like a little over a year and right before that I ran the speed goat 50k and so I, I before started before your first marathon yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, I saw someone DNF that race on YouTube and so I thought it might be a good challenge and <laughs> so I started trail oh, yeah, running that seems hard. just yeah, pretty much just to, to run that race. I think I saw online, didn't you place like 19th? Uh, I, f- I placed 10th. Yeah. Oh, you placed 10th that year. Yeah. So your yeah. first ever distance, like long distance race. What was your training block like for that? I, it's like fascinating yeah, I wanna, to me that you I want to like, say I was probably running like 80 miles a week and okay. was probably maybe like eight, 18,000 vertical feet or something like that. I did. I remember doing a long run um, with some guy I'd never met and did Box Elder Peak twice, and that was like my longest run. But <laughs> I, crazy. I was, I got pretty close to like replicating the race and the training mm-hmm. run before I. That's cool. Ran it, yeah. That's nuts. So after you ran a marathon after that, mm-hmm. and did you like the marathon, or did that convince you to run trail? So I think a lot of my positive results in running have just come from the fact that I landed in Provo, Utah. So that my first marathon, I think I have won a few smaller marathons since then, but I think that was the only marathon I've really actually trained for. And so I, I running marathon seems to be super popular now, but a couple of years ago, I, I felt like there weren't many people training for the marathon and this is actually 2021 was before Connor Mance and Clayton Young and all these people had even like officially gotten into marathon running. And so I found this group in Provo to run with and it was like a couple older guys. And so I was like, OK, I'm going to try to stick with these guys in the training runs. Turned out it was like they'd been running with Jared Ward, who <laughs> hit, and so I'm like, is the only group in Provo that's willing to do a 20 mile long run. And so I start running with them and we have to do our long runs at six minute pace and, or 5.55 pace, I guess, which was, uh, come to find out, it was like Jared Ward's long run pace or something. And he was the most legitimate person. So everyone just ran at whatever pace he would run at when he was there. Yeah, if our listeners don't know who Jared Ward is, he's an Olympic marathoner who in Brazil, didn't he take sixth in the marathon? Yeah, yeah. Which is so nuts because I think he was seated 30th or something like that so to just jump into the running scene here find a group of guys that want to run and then it's Jared yeah. Ward is crazy just some old guy yeah so and then I ran the marathon and tried to stick with 
I like the oldest guy in the group who is that Ian Hunter from BYU is actually like remarkably fast mm -hmm. and but I yeah tried to stick with him and ran I was like 225 at the St. George Marathon which at the time I was like okay I guess that's okay for this group but I didn't think that I was that fast you know I was like if I were really talented maybe I'd be running 218 or something and trying to win this race <laughs> but and so yeah that was my my experience with the marathon and I did like it a lot but I thought you know I live here in Provo and there are mountains you could trade for the marathon anywhere I think Provo is mm -hmm. actually a great place because of all those people who are training so hard mm -hmm. the training the, the training group you know is excellent there but yeah, I thought, you know, I have the mountains here and so maybe that's a better opportunity for me. And so was your goal at that point to do well in races and to place and be competitive? Or was your goal to push your own limits and see where you could take yourself? Yeah, I my goal was definitely to push myself. And I have always been way more interested in like training than racing. Mm. Like, I I think when I saw that marathon, the sub breaking two project, it was like the running on the dirt track in Kenya that was interesting mm. to me. It wasn't the race itself. So mm. I always, it was like running with the long run group that I mentioned, like that was what was interesting to me. It was like looking at later when I went into trail running, I, Jim Walmsley like he used to post on Strava Zach Miller, who still posts. Um, it was looking at that and thinking, I wonder what that's like. That's kind of what's been interesting to me more than the race itself. So, yeah, I think it ultimately was this curiosity that made me want to see what I could do in a race versus that was my end goal. Mm. So as far as, like, interested in the training, are you interested in, like, how much can I do? Or, like, I think they call it, like, a workout warrior, like – doing really well every single day like what about that is interesting and like draws you in yeah um so I've done what some reasonably high volume training I'd say when he says reasonably high volume I'm speaking to our listeners right now well on your Strava don't you average like over a hundred mile weeks yeah so Last year, I, I was like, so I started running the longer ultra marathons, and I thought, okay, I'd like to prepare myself to maybe be good at this in the future. And so I averaged over 100 miles a week and for the whole year, like all 52 weeks of the year, and nice. also did 30, like over 30,000 feet for the whole year as well in terms of just vertical, vertical gain. gain. Yeah. So, yeah, I. I just did that because I was, I liked it. And one thing I found out really early on when I started running is that like, it's by far the easiest way to train to run every day. If you have to wake up each day and be like, is it today or tomorrow that I'm getting the run in? That's really complicated. You mm -hmm. know, it's hard to turn the doorknob at the last minute when you have other priorities and everything. So yeah, t for me, it's, it would be easier to do a long run every day than it would be to get the huge long run in on Saturday or mm. yeah, whatever that might be. So you kind of just try to put in good volume every day. You don't necessarily have one day that you're like, this is my long run day. Yeah. I don't, and I don't think that's the best strategy in terms of getting fast or being good at anything, but it is very easy, I think, like mentally mm. to just kind of do the same thing every day. And I think one thing that kind of made me OK, like decide to be OK with that for a while is like I felt like I was still getting performance gains from putting in volume. And maybe I didn't have a, like a crazy long run every day was just kind of long, but I was like, I'm still getting faster. So when I you know, when that stops, maybe I'll start thinking about doing the double long run or whatever mm -hmm. those different elements are yeah so right now because you're getting faster and getting better you're like well high volume works and I like high volume so I'm gonna stick with it mm -hmm. yep. cool so 
volume that first year over 100 mile weeks and then 30,000 feet of vertical gain for the whole year after I think last year what did you hit in vertical gain I think it was like almost hit one and a half million feet okay that's nuts that's crazy is this combined with skiing or is this just running um I think it was just running yeah that's a lot of vertical gain <laughs> So did you have that goal in mind or was that just your training ended up being one and a half million? Yeah, that was, it was not a goal. It just kind of happened. So, yeah. Cool. Um, maybe walk me through your bear 100 build and okay. how you decided to do that and maybe how other people could replicate that in their own way to have a good first 100 mile race. Okay. So just, yeah, to review my Bear 100 last year, I signed up for the Bear 100 like a month and a half before, two months before, something like that. And just because you got I, in on the wait list or? Yeah, it, okay. I was kind of like a backdoor race director, oh, okay. got me into the race. And I think it worked out fine because I set the course record there. <laughs> yeah. But it... Yeah, but I know that's not usually the way you get into that race. But, um, yeah, so I I ran that race. Some guy named Jake Krog, he went out at, like, the course record pace, and I kind of ha- hung on, and I was, I was super excited that he was trying to run the course record, and I thought, you know, I'll try to push him, and this really – is hyping me up the fact that he wants to run this face and then like 50 something and I would didn't run a step in front of him for the first 50 something miles so this is you're at the start line you see you talk to this guy find yeah, out yeah. he's about to try to break the course record and you're like oh I'll stick with you yeah and I'm a big <laughs> proponent of like talking to people mm. during a an ultra marathon like talking to the other racers mm. um I would wait I would much prefer to race a friend than like an enemy in Mm -hmm. a race like that because like if if I am running with someone and in an ultra marathon a lot of times you know at a certain point you just have to run your own pace once you get to the later stages of the race and you'll you'll drop someone and then they'll come back and if you know if someone you hate is catching up to you that's gonna be that's gonna (laughs) <laughs> be depressing you know that's Stressful. tough um but if your friend is catching back up that puts a smile on your face and that's gonna be m- motivating and so yeah I I feel like I actually perform better if I'm happy to be running with the people I'm with and so yeah I try to talk to a lot of people during that race and but after like 50 miles something happened and he had a hamstring issue or something and so I'm like, all right, I like, I really <laughs> like this pace. Let's keep it going. It's up and to so, me. <laughs> kind of like even split the whole thing. And once the sun started going down, I started feeling even better. And so, um, just ran through the finish. And so, and it was like a, however many minutes, like a 40 minute course record. It or something. sounds so easy when you say it like this. Yeah. It, like, it, I even it was, split it and just yeah. ran through the finish. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, at that point, it was easy. And what, led to that happening was that I had a big goal to run a race called CCC earlier in the year which was the second it was it's a little more than the second half of the ultra trail Mont Blanc and so you go run from um, Italy through Switzerland and then finish in France and Chamonix which is where uh, UTMB starts and finishes and that is a super competitive 100k race it's like most competitive 100k of the year and isn't it part of their world series yes yeah yeah it's like the final of the world series that they have and i you know it's in europe and i i'm fortunate enough to have been able to go there a couple times and so when i went I was like so this is the second time i've been there but when i got to the alps i was so excited to be there that I really wanted to make the most of the experience rather than taper perfectly for this race. And so mm-hmm. I ended up like, I had the biggest vert week of my life the week before. 
No and way. I climbed the Matterhorn twice, which is like you climbed it once and you're like, I gotta do this again. Yeah. Um I did it once with the guide and then the second I was like I felt, you know, I like to kind of do stuff in a run tour kind of way where yeah. you start in a town and run to the top and back down and so I did it that style the second time. And I was like putting crampons on and doing stuff and having so much fun, but it didn't like perfectly set me up for a great race at CCC. So I got 18th in that race and which is still pretty nuts coming from like you are currently like at the time of starting that race just some kid from Provo Utah who's like I want to compete in this race right so yeah to go do the highest mileage week highest vertical mileage week of your life and then still place 19th is yeah it speaks to the athlete that you are for sure we're excited to announce our first podcast sponsor creatures of habit they have a great overnight oat product called meal one there's a ton of different flavors and each flavor has just about 30 grams of plant-based protein you put it in the fridge the night before take it out the morning of and you have a nice balanced breakfast to fuel you for your workout if you use our code STORER at creaturesofhabit.com, you get 10% off. And we'd also like to thank our sponsor, Coach Soak. Coach Soak is a brand that focuses on athletes' recovery. Their products have magnesium flakes, mineral-rich sea salts, and essential oils in them that will help aid you in their recovery. These products come in lotions, sprays, and bath salts. If you use code STORER at checkout, that will get you 10% off. Yeah, so... Right, so I I placed 19th overall in the top woman in the race. Um, Ingrid Casperson actually ended up uh, I ended up running like the last third of the race with her or something. And cool. It was very cool. You know, she was running a much more fluid and like professional race than I was. Mm. But it was like, yeah, like we crossed the finish line within like a minute of each other, and all the cameras are on her, and I kind of have to slip across the finish line, and I'm like. I think I could have done a little better than this. Mm -hmm. And it was like an experience that really like hyped me up. And I'd done more training than I needed to before that. And so I got back and like started school and I'm in electrical engineering. So like I was super busy with classes, but I somehow it hyped me up to a level where like I did some pretty crazy training I did a 175 mile week, like while I was in school and it like was a breeze. I don't know. I was just like, <laughs> it was go to breeze. school. <laughs> I was going to work as well. And then I would come home and like run until like after it was dark. And it was like, a, this is 175 miles of only single one run a day. What but, are you eating? Yeah. <laughs> it's like giving you this energy. That's nuts. <laughs> yeah. So whatever I was eating, it wasn't, <laughs> you know, it was the calories that were important. It wasn't. Yeah. 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 So it was a lot of, you know, maybe donuts and all kinds of ice cream and stuff like that. But it got that week over with. And then I ended up at the bear. Mm. And so lining up for the bear, having done CCC and really high vertical per week you know the bear it's a little over 20,000 vertical feet and I had done weeks with over 50,000 feet so I'm like okay I'm lining up for this race I don't think there's anything that can happen with my legs like I think I have legs of steel (laughs) Uh, I'll just run however fast I can (laughs) run and it should be fun and that's what ended up happening and it was a it wasn't the struggle that I think a lot of first under mile races might be but it was still a good experience and it was it was fun to be there so that's how that went so how to run a successful first 100 mile race top it off at 175 miles a week and just have fun it sounds like (laughs) yeah yeah that's awesome so how did those aid stations go did you go in with I mean, you didn't go in thinking you were going to break the course record, but did you have a plan for aid stations? Was there a crew that was helping you? Yeah, so... How do you approach that? um, I was pretty happy with the crew that I had. 
um, my fiance, my girlfriend at the time, she came. And then my friend, Sam Collins, he was there with me as well. And Sam is like, like out of control hyped for me the whole race, which is cool. Um, he'd been like a top finisher at the Run Rabbit Run er, before. So he, I, I trusted that he understood what was going on. Mm. And it was one of those races where I made a nutrition strategy and I just kind of followed it exactly the whole time and nothing really went wrong and didn't change anything. I was purely, I was just using like every aid station I'd come in, get two fresh bottles of like the Morton gel mix, put both bottles in and then I'd take a bunch of cis gels and try to eat as many as I could. And then I had a few cliff shot blocks and a little bit of Coke and Coca-Cola and that was it yeah that's nuts and it worked great so yeah. did you have a gra- uh, goal for like grams of carbs per hour or like sodium per hour or was it just like eat as much as i can yeah it was i didn't think about it in terms of grams per hour but it was kind of a guess about how much i could consume okay yeah and so i did total it all up afterward and it you know, I did consume 5,000 something calories of purely sugar after that whole experience. And so I think it was like fairly high, like an 80, 90 grams per hour. Or something. Yeah, it sounds. Because how fast did you finish the bear? Finished in 1711. 1711. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah, so that does. I don't have a calculator and I'm not yeah. going to do that in my head, but probably about 80 to 90 grams per hour. Yeah, so that probably worked out fine. Mm-hmm. And. I have sense, I think that is a little risky going with both bottles always filled with a drink mix because with a high carb drink mix. Oh, yeah. Because if you end up needing more water, then you're kind of out of luck because you have to force, you know, you can't go based on intuition of how much carb and water balance you should have. Um, Whereas if maybe, you know, in my most recent race in Andorra, I would do one bottle of water potentially, or like, yeah, a lot of these European races, they like have uh, aid stations where there's no crew allowed. And so, and it's like, okay, like what do they have? And they say they have one thing. It turns out they only have water. Uh. Yeah. And like, so it helps to maybe you go one bottle with something and then one bottle of water and then a little heavier on gels and things like that. And that replaces the mix that had been in that bottle. And Mm. that can help you be a little more, follow your intuition. Yeah. A little better. I have definitely been like on training runs where I only brought like carb mixes or like sodium mixes. And I like really regret it because it's like, I need water right now. (laughs) But you can't when it's just carbs. So I think that's a good point to like point out to people. Mm Mm-hmm cool and then at the aid stations were they obviously they're like giving you gear was there anything else that you feel like was exceptionally helpful or pretty straight it sounds like it was pretty straightforward yeah so Mm -hmm. uh, yeah so at the bear 100 i did i would only get nutrition at the aid stations and then i changed my shoes halfway in Mm -hmm. it wasn't like i need dry shoes i need dry socks I was going for a shoe that had a different like midsole geometry so that my legs would feel different. And so, you know, it's like a smart, whatever is going wrong biomechanically. If it is something else will be going wrong in the second half because like the geometry of the shoe is a little different. And so I don't know if that was necessary, but it felt great. And so that's what I ended up doing. Do you do that always now? So, yeah, I think I I can get away with just wearing one shoe. And so um, I would probably do that again for a hundred mile though. Yeah. Switch the shoes at the halfway point. Yeah. Cool. So you took the course record at the bear and how much attention did you get for that? Did you get a lot of attention for that? Um, I don't think so. I think if you do a race like that, People will be happy. The local people will just yeah. be happy about it. Local friends or people you meet on the trail. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
that's kind of what that's mostly about i think yeah so after that your next race or the next race i want to talk about i guess was the andorra 100 Mm -hmm. so what did your training look like over the winter what led you to andorra you won andorra so maybe talk to me about that yeah so what like my focus over the last two two and a half years has been getting volume in because well, I remember in 2021 watching the JFK 50 mile with like Hayden Hawks, I think set a course record. Mm-hmm. And I was like looking at how fast he ran and thinking, wow, I didn't realize that they were putting in such a, putting like such a high output down for however long in that race. Somehow it's like five hours, but for 50 miles, which yeah. is crazy with the trails and everything. But I started to think that that would be something I'd like to do is be able to have a high output for a long period of time. And so that's kind of what my training has been sort of focused toward. And so over the winter, I did like a lot of repeats on like hard packed snow going up and down hills. I did almost a hundred K simulation on Malin's peak (laughs) over the winter. So I did 10 laps in 11 hours there. Wow. Like 10 laps up and down Mallon's Peak in 11 hours. And I, there was some event going on at the time. So I had to like run, I had to park in like the neighborhood and use my car as an aid station. And really? yeah, <laughs> but it was pretty fun. Mm-hmm. And I did like 22,000 feet of vertical and like 100K in 11 hours, just having fun on the snow. And so that was one way I trained. And then I tried to ski, do some backcountry skiing. Mm. It was, I didn't feel like that was very time effective. Um, but then I also did like a, fif- a 50 mile a Buffalo run, 50 mile oh, yeah. Antelope Island. You took the course record for that as well. I didn't hit, I didn't hit oh, the course didn't. record. Um, yeah, I went to a hundred mile race, which I wanted to win, but I took a wrong turn. I was <laughs> watching the live yeah. tracking of that and I was like, oh my gosh, he's going to win. And then... Yeah, I saw you took a run. But yeah, that was not a great race. Uh, and maybe we can talk more about the UTMB races. But I th- some I I love that UTMB race in Andorra. But the US UTMB races sometimes can be a little rough in terms of like course marking and those canyons one hundred, right? Yeah, yeah. And I definitely wasn't the first person who's taken a wrong turn there, but. So that did you feel like the course was poorly marked or just yeah, it confusing? Was con- it was very confusing, okay. yeah. So I did that, um, but that was a good training run, and then the trails dried up completely, so I got some good training in. Went out to Andorra. I did a course preview out there, so I did the 100K over three days, and... I actually used a course from a different year that was like considerably harder in some ways than the actual course was. And so I was mentally prepared for something where I was like, I might freeze, I might slip on the (laughs) ice that's still up on the peaks. And um, yeah, and then I ended up hitting my peak mileage week a couple weeks before that. I think I did like 150 miles, but I hit 50,000 feet, vertical feet again, and that was all without poles. So I kind of train without poles at all until right before the race, and then I get used to using them a little bit. And um, I feel like poles are something that can, you know, they take like a small percentage of the weight off of your legs, but that small percentage might be what compounds and ends up giving you a strained calf or a strained quad or something like that so I don't feel like it's a big problem just pulling him out for the race if you've practiced in the past but yeah and then I got to the week of the race and um ran that and the Andorra 100k had some like some big names there it wasn't like a 30 elite runners or anything but like Katarina Hartmuth was there who she was the top finisher at UTMB. I think she was second wow. behind Courtney DeWalter this last year and Francois was there. It, I like 
That was really fun to That's run with crazy. him. That's crazy. And Ben Demon, who I ran most of the race with. Um, I love look, like watching what he does and all of that. Um, so, th- yeah, that was that race. And So describe Andorra 100 to anyone who like maybe doesn't know what the train is like or what kind of the 100K is. Is it a lot of up and down? Is it like a big up, long down type of thing? Yeah, okay. So I kind of became aware of this race because I saw that Zach Miller had done it like a couple years ago as he tried to come back from a foot injury, I think. And it, I, you know, I looked at the results and it's like UTMB will show all of the competitors and it'll show a little flag next to their name because a lot of times they're like international races. And it's like one American flag and like <laughs> it's a, never an no American one flag. is from a different country. <laughs> yeah, it's Zach Miller at the top and then no yeah. one is from America. And uh, this year, Ben Demon and I were both, I guess, American, but he lives over on the edge of Andorra in France. So it's, yeah, and Andorra is a country. It's between Spain and France. And the Andorra 100 is a race that basically goes around the entire country. It, it's a tiny country and it like, hits the two highest points there and it's all in the mountains and you run through the capital which is like just basically crossing a little valley um and then you finish in a town called ordino and it's like almost like the alps except there are horses instead of cows which is kind of interesting they're just like these huge horses yeah but For me, it was a race that really played to my strengths. It has like 20 something thousand vertical feet in 105K. Some we were measuring like 67 to 69 miles for the length of the course and starts and finishes at the same place. So it's not like a net downhill or anything like that. So yeah. So are those peaks that you hit, the two highest points in Andorra, are they pretty technical or the or is it like single track the whole way? Yeah, so there were there are definitely some parts where it's like loose, kind of like loose rock, shale kind of thing. Scree type of. Yeah, mm. jumping between granite boulders and like going up over ridge lines. You go through, um, and it goes around the whole country. So like you go through a ski resort and through two ski resorts like in different parts of the country (laughs) sounds gorgeous (laughs) yeah like a beautiful race an incredible experience to to get to go run that race and the volunteers are like it's like night and day between these races that the utmb organization is kind of taken over in the united states and the ones Mm -hmm. in europe like in europe i've been to ccc and the sandora race and in the race in andorra like I, you know, a lot of people want to be treated a certain way when they come through the aid station. Like, if you come through in first or second place, like I did, I'm thinking I'd like to get in and out really fast because it's kind of a, you know, it's this is the race, you know, this is the front of the race. And they understand that so well. And you feel like every volunteer knows the whole race like the back of their hand. There's no way you could run out the aid station in the wrong direction they can tell you where to go without even having like they just see you and speak the right language it's mm. incredible and that's so cool yeah like playing this like uh classical spanish music with different instruments and stuff and it's like like live no just oh, on there the speaker yeah okay. just over the speaker and you <laughs> like feel like what? i like i got this feeling that like every volunteer was a fan of the sport mm. and I even like had a really rough spot in the middle of the race and went off course a little bit because it was like we're going it was a climb that was like 7,000 feet straight over I don't know how many miles it was like yeah (laughs) like just steep enough that there was or just uh the grade was just shallow enough that you couldn't walk any of it you like had to run the (laughs) the whole thing and I took a slight wrong turn in this cow pasture granite kind of thing and um got back on the trail and some random guy who's just on his run like 
ran with me for a little bit and he wasn't a pacer but it was like um he was talking to me a little bit in english a little bit in catalan which is the language area and i was like this is it's crazy that, ev- that everyone there is like a fan of the sport mm. even like the old lady you see on the street <laughs> so cool. she's like oh it's a race she, she you know my bib was on the back and so they look at me and then i pass and then start cheering it was crazy like yeah, and that was not what I experienced at some races that I had been to in the United States. Yeah, so pretty pretty cool to be able to go to something like that. Yeah, that is so cool. Our last guest, Anna, uh, was living there for a while, and she said she was amazed that, like, everyone there trail runs. Like, everyone's at the cafe with their, like, hydration vests on. Whereas here, it's, like, a little bit more rare to, like, see trail runners at the cafe or whatever. And that's probably what makes the environment of the race is so cool, too. hmm That's nuts. So I think you'd written on Instagram that Ben had kind of challenged you in this race in a good way. In what ways did he help push you? Um, uh, yeah, so Ben obviously Ben Demon is more experienced than me he's won a lot of races and before that he'd won the Midera 100k which is actually even a bigger race than this and he yeah I like just right off the bat I tried to stick with him and I start talking to him and you know he doesn't have to talk to me I'm like you know you know he doesn't know who I am but he's willing to talk to me right away and just be friendly and um, I thought that was really nice because it made the first half of the race go by a lot faster for me and I was having a nice time and, you know, we're like, can we hold off Francois, you know, watching him power hike faster than we've ever seen someone walk before. And yeah, like just a, made it a really nice experience for me. And so, yeah, like in those last couple you know, when we get to that very final climb and you've already climbed over 20,000 feet and I look back and they're, I'm like, oh, they're been still there, you know? <laughs> it's like power hiking up to you. Yeah. <laughs> and I haven't always been the best downhill runner and I've got the last downhill and I can see Ben coming up behind me in the last climb of this race. And even then I'm like, okay, like if he catches up, he catches up and I wouldn't be disappointed to run with him again, even at the end of the race. I felt like that kind of made it positive for me. It would have been pretty tough if I had been running with someone I didn't want to for that whole race. And then Mm. maybe it would have broken me on the last climb, but it didn't. So that was good. That's awesome. So did he catch you? Did you guys have kind of like a battle for the finish or? Oh, I was able to hold. Yeah, I was able to hold him off. Yeah. So finish. I think I had like an eight minute lead at the end. But yeah. Sadly, I had to run with my poles on the (laughs) road at the end. I'd never done that before, but yeah, just get to the finish. Mm. Yeah, I saw your finish on Instagram, I think, and I saw like an interview that you'd done just like immediately after you'd finished. Mm -hmm. And the girl was just like, who are you? Where are you from? And uh, I just thought it was crazy cool that like, yeah, you were able to come out of nowhere and like really show up at this European race with all these big names. Yeah, yeah. And I think that the European style race isn't something that everyone here necessarily appreciates where you have that like higher amount of vertical Mm. for the distance people like to do, you know, like the Black Black Canyon 100 and JFK 50 mile and these races that are like a little different I think Mm -hmm. and um but living in Provo I think it prepares me pretty well to do that kind of steeper type of race so um I do think I if there's one thing I've been preparing for it'd be pretty much that Andorra 100k so I kind of have been dedicated to that type of race yeah because your training is a lot of like a Provo peak over to Cascade and just like long days with high vert, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's very cool. So finishing, winning first, how did that feel? Were you expecting that? Um, yeah, 
so I think it, I have, like, in my experience winning races, you kind of just at a certain point in the race, you think, okay, maybe I should win this race. And because you've kind of gotten a feel for everyone in the race and you have put in some effort and you've seen everyone's endurance and you see how people start to fall apart or kind of endure the race. And so, yeah, like by the end of the race, it was like, I should win this. And so I don't think it was a huge surprise at that point. But yeah, I was really happy to be there. I think I was just kind of, um, I felt more like enriched to be there with those other guys. Um, that was, I was more kind of savoring experience versus like having a moment of victory, uh, really. Yeah. 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 And in your description of the race, it does sound like just like your training, you experience, you appreciate like the experience of it more so than kind of the outcomes. Yeah. Yeah. And at the same time as well, thinking, you know, I don't know if everyone I know will really understand what this experience means to me, but I think that they might at least think it's interesting. <laughs> yeah, totally. So what did that experience mean to you then, if well, you could summarize it? Yeah, well, I do feel like at a certain point, I was just watching YouTube and watching UTMB there and thinking about trail running. And I remember like watching the, like Killian and Francois and these other guys competing at UTMB and so for me it, it just was more like a number of surreal moments like looking like okay that's Francois in front of me it was kind of crazy but yeah um more like self actualizing like the thing you'd been dreaming about for a long time yeah I um you know as someone who is a bit of a fan of of the sport of trail run, I, I feel like the ultimate fan experience is to be there mm. competing in the race at the front. And so I feel like I got a little bit of that ultimate fan experience there, but I'd like to, you know, kind of keep building and obviously get into more competitive races again, like CCC, which I'll be back at this year. So long-term, what are your goals in trail running? being competitive do you want like would you be interested in signing with a sponsor eventually and like regularly competing in these pro trail races yeah so I do think that at a certain point it's like if I keep doing these races and putting the training in I'm gonna feel like okay if I can win big races and then everyone on the podium is sponsored by someone. I'll just be like, okay, can't I be sponsored too? <laughs> um, I think, yeah, uh, at some point that would definitely make sense. Um, but I don't have anything that's wor been worked out so far. Mm. Yeah, and I kind of want to take this time to maybe explain UTMB a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I think that acronym is confusing for people who are new to trail running or who are road runners, um, I don't think they really understand what UTMB means for the trail running community. Do you want to maybe give a little description of what it is, how you collect stones, how you collect points, and maybe what your score means? Sure. Yeah, so UTMB stands for Ultra Trail Mont Blanc. It's a race in Europe, which they're the highest mountain in Eastern Europe is Mont Blanc and there are three countries that surround the massif which is just this extensive range right there around the mountain just covering glaciers and stuff but there's a trail that was commonly hiked that's over 100 miles long that goes between France with Switzerland and Italy and it was made into a trail running race so it's it's really kind of one of the probably the biggest mountain running 100 mile race in the world and in Europe the races aren't exactly 100 miles it's more about the course versus an exact distance but um yeah a lot of people here they'll think okay should I move up to the marathon 
am I going to train for a marathon? And, you know, just quick message, you can run 100 miles, actually. You know, you can run all these different distances. Um, whatever pace you run your, your marathon at, you can't hold that pace for 100 miles. And so you will actually, you'll get blisters a little bit more slowly. Some of the things that might happen it's not like if you are breaking down at mile 25, you're going to be done by mile 50 because um, things are a little different once that distance starts slowing you down, once the climbing starts slowing you down. And so, yeah, m from my experience, actually, you can do longer races and it doesn't break down your body. You feel stronger afterward. But, yeah, it's a huge race and it's pretty cool because it's, it's like the Boston Marathon in that like there are tons of people running the race. Yeah. And part of my trip to Andorra I w was to qualify for that race as well. After I took a wrong turn at the Canyons 100, I went back and auto qualified for 2025. So I'll be part of that eventually. And it's it's like really a mountainous race because there's over 30,000 feet of climbing in it. And also a lot of road sections in between which is, which is like really difficult to handle going from you know you're like oh i bet i could just hit a few eight minute miles but then once you're carrying all the stuff they make you carry and you run 60 miles i mean it's a different story trying to hit those paces and it kind of sucks honestly even hitting like service roads after running single track for a long time it's like ouch <laughs> yeah you're like uh, you just have to pour on a, like a hundred percent effort just to yeah. get your normal road paces or totally yeah yeah so right now just so that like the people listening understand i wrote down your so utmb will score you based on how you do in different races mm -hmm. and uh your score is quite high like in the hundred mile distance and i think the 100k distance it just automatically qualifies you as like a so pro runner. yeah yeah there's been a lot of pushback against utmb because they were purchased by lifetime fitness the iron man group and like in the acquisition they tried to acquire a lot of races in the united states and that's not it's not like that's something that hasn't been done before by other groups yeah and um, you know, as far as that goes, I think that the product in the United States is a, you know, I'm not sure that I feel like it's an uh, exceptional experience, those races. But one of the nice things is when you finish their races, they give you a, what they call an index. And so if your index or ranking is high enough, um, you are able to just get into whatever race you want for free, which I have taken advantage of this year. And so I'm doing more UTMB events. And you know, at a certain point, I think that's nice because I think I could get into some races around other races with different race directors. But what's difficult is like, you know, like who, who do you email? You know, who do you talk to? And some people will almost like look down on you and say, we don't care who you are. We won't let you in. Why are you asking to get into this race? I don't care if you want to be a top competitor at the race. And you're like, okay, but someone else let me in, you know? And so that's one thing that is kind of easy is that you don't have to negotiate for yourself every single time. Yeah. You just get an index and you're like, oh, I could just go to that race. Just click a button and... I'm in. And so that's kind of nice. And I th I think some of those races in Europe are pretty fun. Yeah. And that's what I do appreciate about it as well is like for someone like you who you're an excellent runner, like you can be competitive. You've proved you can be competitive with like elite runners. Like you're not sponsored yet. You don't have someone paying for all of this for you, but it's a good way to get you exposure, to get you more races that can eventually just open more opportunities for you. And I do appreciate that about UTMB. Although like right now I have listened to a lot of podcasts, a lot of Instagram things that kind of like bash on UTMB, which yeah. understandable in some aspects, like 
personally, I do prefer like a less produced race, but I see where UTMB is like needed and also just like fun to have a lot of spectators and yeah. A lot of and production. I just think, I just feel you know I don't think they can buy up every race you know um, we have so many races and people starting races just to be the race director or who knows what and so I think that there is an appetite for smaller races and you can always go to them and I I love smaller races I've done a couple this year already so I always I'll keep doing that and um, go to the I think the UTMB races are also an easy way to find some great competition as well yeah that's awesome um maybe you can talk to us a little bit about like your recovery your nutrition you're an engineer do you get kind of into the data and plan these things out for yourself so i i really don't actually um (laughs) yeah i am really into trying to lower the amount of effort that i need to put into running and one of the kind of philosophies I've had is that, so I, yeah, I am about to graduate in electrical engineering and it's taken a lot of time. And when I look at my day, let's say I have four hours to run, four hours to put toward becoming a better runner. Um, I'm probably, because I'm doing ultra marathons, I'm probably gonna try to spend all four of those hours running. Mm. And there is a huge number of things you could do. You know, you could cook, you could go get a massage, you could go to the gym, you can do all these different things. And um, I remember like Killian Jornet, I think last year talking about how there was kind of a, he made this graph of what the, what had the highest impact and the lowest cost. And it it was like so obvious that if you're a person who has a limited amount of time per day, you should put it all into running and sleeping. Like right. sleeping was the second priority after running. And if you had maximized those two things, then maybe you put it into strength training. And then if you'd maximize that, maybe you start going into massages and like different things like that where um, those are things that maybe if you're a professional who has all day, that starts to become a good idea for me i don't have all day but with the time i have i i just kind of rather put it into running and uh, as far as food goes um yeah i just try to get the calories and i haven't um you know it, i just have to i have to eat a lot so i i'll just and i think when you do eat a lot of food sometimes you end up getting in nutrients that you didn't necessarily plan in because you ate so much that it like mm. cover bases that maybe yeah. would be, if you're on a diet where you're cutting weight or something then you have to be careful but mm. yeah i do f- think maybe you know i have some more room to not be super careful when i do eat enough food mm. yeah i think that's a good point and something that can kind of alleviate a lot of new runners concerns as well is like people message me on instagram all the time asking me these like super niche questions and they're like i'm running my first ultra next year and i'm wondering like should i take this creatine and i'm like don't even worry about it like there are you're right there are things that like are going to make better use of your time than maybe obsessing over those little small things yeah, and maybe I've left a lot of performance on the table. That might be interesting, but I also have been happy with how I've been able to perform, almost leaving nutrition as something to look into at a later date. So, mm. yeah. Yeah, and who knows? Maybe there is like huge gaps in your nutrition yeah. that you fix, and suddenly you're. It's been confused. very much uh, an intuitive eating. Just mm. make sure I eat enough during the day that I am ready to go as soon as I get a chance to go for a run I need to make sure that I am feeling energetic and energetic for a long time and if I ever I normally don't use gels and things like that for my daily runs but if I do it's just in order to have energy at like just the right time you know if you need to start your run now 
you don't want, I don't want to be eating a meal and then waiting an hour and then taking two hours off of my run because of that. Then I'll just, okay, let's take a gel mm -hmm. so I can get out the door right now. And is that kind of how you're getting in all of this high mileage training is just like kind of optimizing your time to spend most of it out running or what are your tips for runners who are high volume? Yeah, it's like, Honestly, it's like when you get home from work and when does the sun go down and you try to spend most of that time outside and yeah, um, that's pretty much all it is. <laughs> it's super simple. Yeah. <laughs> you, you said you just got engaged. Um, how does your fiance feel about like all of your running? Is she super supportive? How do you balance a relationship, work, school, running, I guess is my question. Yeah. So we'll spend time together like every night and... Um, she likes going for runs too and we've just been so like busy with school and trying to like get so many things in that it's kind of like an expectation that we both have something to do all the time anyway mm -hmm. so she's been really supportive and um, you know I I'm able I think it's nice to be able to do races every once in a while because it does kind of and it's not like she really is looking for this, but it does provide some amount of proof that I'm like working <laughs> towards something. Yeah. And even like for my, I mm -hmm. think it's nice for like my family to see it or yeah. other people, even like people I work with. It's like, I'm leaving work early. Um, sometimes is that something that you understand? Well, I think it probably is when I do a race and then you like, oh wow, I, you know, there's something that shows you've made progress and I yeah that's kind of nice for them even if you don't like racing I think if you're in the mountains all the time it might be nice to do something and then yeah kind of <laughs> helps justify it to other people yeah and break the monotony a little bit too it gives you a chance to like have something in your mind I guess mm -hmm. yeah. well I do want to be respectful of your time you probably have a run to go on later tonight um, but if you would leave our audience with something actionable that they can implement, if there's someone out there who's listening to this who's like, oh my gosh, Zach is so cool. I want to be like him. What, What's your actionable advice? Well, yeah, I I've, I've don't feel like I am started out as anyone noteworthy at all, and I don't know if I am right now still. But one thing I would just say is, you know you see these professional runners they do their fall marathon and they have this cadence to what they do and i would just say look at what is the best opportunity for you personally and just go for that and you know people will talk about when is the right time to move up to a marathon or do you want to stay with the 10k or should you be able to run a fast mile and you'll hear college runners talk about that but like for the average person you know, like try a trail race or try something longer. Um, and, you know, whatever the longest thing is you can actually prepare for and um, just see how it goes. Because if, if that's the opportunity that's best for you, there's no reason to be limited to a schedule that was based off of someone else. They're like my first long run experience, like Jared Ward's long run pace. Like I didn't need to be tied down to that, but it was fun. And um, yeah, you don't necessarily need to follow what other people are doing when maybe that was based on someone else's plan. So kind of follow your own intuition, motivation, wherever mm -hmm. that pulls you. Yeah. Cool. I'm going to link your Instagram and your Strava in the description below. Um, and if anyone wants to follow Zach, please do so. What's your next race? Um, next race is the Speed Goat 50K. Oh, that's so soon. Yeah, that's in a week and a half. We going for a course record again? <laughs> I Yeah, <laughs> I was sick last <laughs> week, but I'm hoping to make it to the starting line. So. Ooh, I'm so yeah. excited for you. Cool. Thank you so much, Zach. Mm-hmm.